your clan, Ruja, the rebel rebel against power and rage against authority, a seemingly insignificant man with significant ideas will join their ranks tonight. Red true, the aristocratic blue bloods and body and wealth, sovereignty and control. A top-level corporate executive will join their ranks tonight. Toreador. The divas seek thrills of art, romance and cruelty amidst stagnant art death. A tormented artist will join their ranks tonight. We shall go with the blue jar. Name shall be Eric. New York taught me to believe in fate. Had you asked me about fate back when I was a human, I would have told you it's just superstitious bullshit that we are all designers of our own destinies. That belief shattered when the richest woman in the United States, the actual richest one, not a face you could have seen in the papers, of course, sank her deep, deep into my neck. It happened in the very same place you're standing in right now. By the way, fate, you decide. Please, there's absolutely no need to be hostile. Just listen a little longer. See, my mistake was that I flew too close to the sun. It makes sense that my punishment was to never see its glow again. I was incandescent myself. I was hot shit. I had it all. Money, looks, confidence, connections, with men, women, a career and a spark in my eye, the one you need to be born with. And that's when someone far more powerful than me saw my radiance and thought, that would do. She robbed me of the light erupting from within and gave me a subtle, subtle, enduring gleam in its place. She decided that would fight me much better. She was a ninth generation kindred, just like you, an apex predator. She probably enjoyed teaching me the peak of human excellence, my real place in the food chain. It's such an eyesore when you look at some loudmouth braggart and see them for all they really are. The temptation to teach them a lesson can be unbearable. Right. Well, my sire's lesson was a lesson about fate. A message saying you're eternally doomed to be at the mercy of your sovereigns. It almost drove me to destroy myself. What saved me was the ability to reinterpret her teachings. Hers wasn't a message of doom. It was a message of hope. Fate exists, and one can shape it if given the right tools. My sire didn't believe my tools were fitting for the job. She considered them toys, and me, just her amusing subject. Well, she's deader than dead now, and I'm still here, standing right where she stood when we first met. might have wondered how I learned about your arrival to JFK Airport. My answer is, of course, destiny. As luck would have it, today happened to be a day some of my associates were inspecting the coffins. Driving you here straight from the plane and having you wake up in such an unfamiliar place was a little 
desperate, and I do apologize for it. But it is so rare for you to visit New York three times in the last 15 years, was it? And you're never eager to inform me you're here. I understand you still have that meeting on 53rd Street later tonight, so I'll provide a comfortable transport. I value our relationship very much, don't get me wrong. But it is precisely because I value it that I'm going to ask you to repay the favor you owe me. You're the only one I trust to do the job well and without attracting attention. You might think I'm crazy, asking you to preach the rules of our society like this. You might think it's impossible to get away with it unpunished. But this is New York, and I don't know about other cities, but in this one, fate really exists. And right now, it's smiling in your favor. This is how it begins. Music is pounding and your pulse is keeping pace. This is one of those nights that makes you feel alive, even though it started with you feeling dead. First came the messy breakup, then the realization you have nobody to talk to about how much it sucked. Still, you decided to roll with the punches. One Facebook search for local events later, and you found just the thing for your malaise. A short subway ride, and you find yourself at the club just outside Dumbo. Not a fast, fancy one, mind you. More like a, my car. Slightly refurbished warehouse, but hey, at least the drinks are cheap. Jay seems to really know his shit too, alternating between cutting edge industrial techno and classic Detroit crowd pleasers, expertly feeling out everyone's mood. An hour passes, then two. Usually you'd feel awkward coming to a place like this alone, but tonight you find something soothing in joining the crowd blending in, even as you allow the beat to take over. Sweat, yours, other people's, soaks through your shirt and pants in a matter of minutes. A thought pops into your head. From the outside, the fully packed club must seem like a stuffy, smelly nightmare. But here, in the thick of it, it becomes accelerating. You're not even on a pill tonight. There's this Latina chick whose curves are accentuated by the light dress clinging to her body and she keeps bumping into you. Something tells you it only seems incidental. Yeah, it's a good night. You wish it could last forever. Because you know all too well what the next day holds. Waking up, getting dressed for work, the commute, the 9 to 5 grind that will make you just enough money to pay the rent and keep living in your overpriced shithole of an apartment. And with Jessica moving out, it'll all be coming out of your pocket. You run some quick calculations in your head and immediately come to regret that you did. Never mind, you spot the Latina again. She's now next to another guy, hitting it off. Your chance of not going to bed alone, gone. Just like that. Fuck. Your mood temporarily shut down. You leave the dance floor and stumble your way to the filthy bathroom. You take a look in the mirror and start to wash your face obsessively. Over and over again. A voice from the past echoes in your mind.
I've never felt like this with anyone. Seriously, I mean it. I feel like all of my relationships up to this point were test runs. A shitty way to compensate for my low self-esteem. But this, this feels right. Finally. Shut up, Jess. This was the craziest fucking day of my life. God, I need a smoke. Pass me a light. What do you mean? Cops took the lighter? There's one in your mouth. Just shut the hell up. This is not you. Not anymore. Oh, fuck off! This is so like you, acting like some sort of Clint Eastwood wannabe when I really, really need you to open up. You think you're impressing people with this stuff, guy act? Fuck you. I know how broken you really are. You need therapy. Yeah. Now that sounds like the Jessica of today, you raise your head and look in the mirror. You try to smile, but all you can muster is a self-pitying grin. And there she is, the Latina from before. She says you look like you need a drink. You hesitate for a second or two and then blurt out a surprisingly enthusiastic Yeah. You start to talk, it quickly becomes evident that she's into politics and you're eager to please. You might be a corporate drone, but you spend a lot of evenings reading theory, actual theory, not bastardized twist. Twitter cliff notes and organizing for all manners of courses online. The status quo sucks. There must be something better, she agrees. You seem to subscribe to the same progressive pro political theories, have compatible ideas about the DSA's missteps, even watch the same YouTube channels. Your goals are aligned. She's a bit more radical than you'd have guessed. You attended a few rallies, been to a few protests, but this girl sounds like she broke her share of faces, kicked more than a couple of cops in the nuts over the course of her activist career. Her seal is infectious. She taps into pent up anger that you didn't know you had. The nosy club stops working for you both, so you hit the streets. Just as you're leaving, the DJ starts playing all the things she said by TATU. Of course, you chuckle to yourself, trying not to slip into a bad headspace. She chuckles along with you. It's chilly outside, but soon enough you find yourself too invested in listening to the girl's voice and care about anything else. You realize you've been holding hands for a while. The subway car is empty, save for a stoic middle-aged couple and a drunk staring intently at his own feet. Plenty of room to stretch out, and yet she sits right next to you. You can feel her tie pressing into yours, her breath on the side of your neck. Maybe it's the booze talking but you distinctly hear your voice asking if she'd like to crash at your place. I've got a better idea, she says. At this point, you're down for anything as long as it lets you spend just a few more minutes with her. She takes you to a sleazy model in the Bronx, trading a few words with the balding, tired-looking guy at the front desk. He hands her a key, still holding your hand. The woman leads you up the stairs. The room you end up in 
is almost comically stereotypical, complete with flaking paint and a sticky floor. Not that it matters though, the moment you step through the door, she's on you. You try to take the lead, but she's having none of it. Before you know it, you feel the rickety bed pressing against your back. It's sloppy, fun, fierce. And not once does she lose the initiative. Your hands reach under her t-shirt. Strange, it didn't look like she was cold outside. But now her skin feels eerily cool. As if sensing your confusion, she slaps your hands off of her. She kisses your neck, you are overwhelmed by the sensation. Darkness. The taste of liquid fire and smoke on your tongue. Her voice saying, Sorry kid, I did what I had to do to leave this city in one piece, but don't worry. My blood and your principles, you're gonna do just fine. She slams the mother room door behind her as she leaves. You lie helpless on the soil pungent mattress for some time, minutes, hours, before you can focus enough to try and piece together your evening, it hits you. The big Hunger. It grips you by the throat and makes your insides shrivel in terror. It's an all encompassing emptiness that throws you on all fours. You crawl for a while, squirm on the floor in sundering pain, then jump to your feet and bust out the door. Blackout. This isn't the room you saw when you last closed your eyes. Somebody curses at you, a small, naked buff dude holding a short leather whip. Well, what a goofy motherfucker. He throws a punch. He yells out several slurs. He hits you in the jaw, you black out again. The guy isn't moving anymore. There's blood on his neck, there's blood on his arms, there's blood on the floor, there's blood everywhere. Wow, whoever did this is one sick puppy. You realize you're sitting on top of his corpse. You hear a whimper. Someone else is there, a woman. Her arms are tied to the bed frame, an eye mask over her face red marks on her back. This time you see it happen. You want to stop but can't. She almost manages to get a scream out, but it dies in her throat as you bite into the side of her neck. You drink. Blood. You're drinking blood. You could swear you feel her life force escaping her body, entering yours. Suddenly terrified, you tear away from her. She's not moving, but she's breathing. There's barely a mark on her neck. The guy on the floor, though. You double over in a spasm, realizing what you did. You feel like throwing up, but can only gag. Panic sits in as another realization dawns on you. Your heart is not beating. You put two fingers to your wrist, but feel no pulse. Same thing on the neck. Nothing. There's no breath coming out of your mouth. You have to get out. Get someone to call an ambulance. For yourself at least. Probably too late for the dude on the floor. Did you really kill him? What a mess. You look up. The door to the room. Is a jar. A tall, handsome, broad shouldered man fills the entire frame. He brushes an imaginary speck of dirt off his perfectly tailored suit. 
Call 911. Hey man, you gotta help me. Call 911. So that you get arrested and reported as jail suicide within the next 24 hours? Because that's the only way that plays out, son. He surveys the room, not moving an inch from where he is standing. He shakes his head in mock concern. Murder, assault, that's 25 to life if you're lucky. But since you're not, it's a death sentence. He takes a glance at his expensive looking watch. Lucky for you, it's been a slow night. Otherwise, I might not have gotten here in time. Come on, the sun comes up in a few hours. You don't wanna be around here when it does. Fuck you, I'm not going anywhere with you. An angry scowl appears on his face. Language, well... The man approaches you and starts talking. His tone remains unnaturally calm. Oddly enough, you find it both soothing and slightly unnerving. Now, listen to me. I know this is all new to you, but I've dealt with hundreds of strays like you, and going by experience, they tend to fall into two categories. First, there are the smart ones who carefully obey my every word and don't try to pull off anything stupid. I always get them where they need to be, safe and sound. Then, there are the dumb ones. The punks who thought they could take me on. The wise guys who tried to contact somebody secretly and without permission. Troublemakers who tried to run off or make a scene. None of them got to their destination in one piece. In fact, most of them never reach their destination at all. His voice becomes slightly bored and monotone. You can tell he's given this speech before, likely dozens of times.